there, everyone. Welcome to yet another episode of What You're Watching with Jamie and Bo, the only podcast uh, on the internet featuring two people talking about movies that I'm aware of. I am Bo. <laughs> and I am Jamie. And uh, I like to start uh, every podcast not only with that kind of brutal honesty, but <laughs> also... <laughs> With the question, uh, Jamie, uh, what you watching? I'm watching lots. Um, my first pick, though, is we're going to go way back. Oh, wow. Well. Way back to 1971. Because I got up super early on a Sunday morning. And that's when I get to watch the things that Brian wouldn't be necessarily interested in if, I, <laughs> if he was up. Mm -hmm. So... I got a craving, and this happens every couple years. I need to watch this movie, and that is the original, maybe, obsession film with uh, Play Misty for Me. Oh, wow. Yeah. Boy. That one, okay. I do have, there are a couple, now Brian actually did come out and watch it with me, as it turns out, but I ended up having to fast forward through a couple parts because if anyone is familiar with that film, it's a great movie. Mm -hmm. But, uh, Clint Eastwood is a huge jazz fan, huge. And he, uh, they purposely featured the Montreal Jazz Festival in this film quite a lot. So there, there is one part of the movie toward the end where one, there is just a, it's a, uh, it, it's him walking on the beach with his girlfriend and they play the entire song of, um, Oh, what is it? Um, the first time ever I saw your face oh, by, Roberta, okay. by Roberta Flack. Yeah, yeah, it's a beautiful song, but they play the entire song, and all it is is just them walking around like it's a Sessions commercial. <laughs> and then it go. Now that is something that just aged me. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's funny. It's a good joke. <laughs> Thank you for getting it. Um, but. Then it goes directly from that into about 10 minutes of footage of the Montreal Jazz Festival. So, and you can just, you can just skip right through those parts because nothing happens there. It's just, that's all it is. But other than that, I really love the movie. Is, all right. Is Sandra Locke in that movie? No, it is. Um, oh, I, you know, I, I'm just trying to place it because I'm trying to remember. It's been forever since I watched that. I ought to go back and watch that, too. I found it. I can't remember if it was HBO or Tubi, but I want to say it might have been Tubi. And I actually own it, but, you know, I don't want to get up and go look for it. I just, <laughs> if it's streaming, I'll just watch it there. Jessica Walter played uh, Evelyn, the person oh, who wow. was who was obsessed with him from and archer his, and all that yeah 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 and his girlfriend was played by donna mills so that may be the blonde that you were thinking mm, of but mm. um but yeah so if anybody doesn't know clint eastwood plays a radio dj he is uh for a jazz station and he has this listener that calls in fairly frequently now it does we don't get a whole history of that in the beginning because it just sort of, you just sort of know, like you just know it that she, that she calls all the time because he is not surprised by this request, but it kind of jumps in pretty quick. It doesn't, you don't have to wait a long time for this shit to get rolling. So uh, she calls in and she requests the song play Misty for me. And then one day <laughs> he uh, goes to, and there's this bar that he, talks about all the time on his radio show and he goes there after his show. And so she knows that being an avid listener. So there's one evening that she shows up and they sort of meet each other. He ends up taking her home and he is very straightforward with her that pretty much this is all there is. And she's like, you know, okay. You know, like that she's fine with that except for when she starts randomly showing up at his house or showing up at the radio station or showing up at his restaurants where he is or trying to kill his maid. Like it's mm -hmm. like, she is fucking crazy. And, um, but the thing I noticed about this was uh, one, there is a point where he is 
like he tells her right away like no this is you know you got to stop doing this like he's trying to be nice but at the same time he's trying to be firm but then there is a time when she shows up at his house and she's wearing nothing underneath her coat and she opens her coat and then he rushes her inside because he doesn't want his neighbors to see her naked on his front porch but then he ends up sleeping with her again and i'm like fuck dude like i was on his side completely and then he does that and i'm like god damn it like you know better but then people are pe- like humans are humans humans, right, right, right. humans, are, humans are gonna human um he never stopped being honest with her so i'll give him that uh, but what I did notice was there are several similarities to f- films that would come after. For instance, um, Madame Butterfly features in this film. Mm-hmm. And and Evelyn says it is her favorite opera. And she attempts to kill herself in exactly the same Wait, like the setup for the scene is almost exactly the same as it is in Fatal Attraction, in which, of course, Madame Butterfly features prominently in Fatal Attraction. So I was like, wow, that is one very interesting, uh, but also Fatal Attraction clearly pulled from this film. And there was another one, too, that I caught while I was watching it with another movie that it ref- that made reference to this, not not really referencing it, but basically took from it Mm -hmm. but i can't remember what that was but this is like the if you like obsession films i love them it's one of my favorite subgenres. if you like films like that like fatal attraction or any of those numerous (laughs) obsession like films then i think you kind of owe it to yourself to go back and watch this one because it was if not the first of that kind it was very early on and very influential Hmm. Uh, yeah, I need to go back and watch it. I mean, it's been so long. I remember broad, broad strokes of Play Misty for me, but I I do not recall enough detail about it. But yeah, that's cool. That's a that's a really cool pick to start off with. I I like where your head's at, Jamie. <laughs> Yay! Um, I like uh, reminding people of things on occasion. So. Uh, here's a little movie that I would like to talk about if, if and you don't mind. No. Nope. Um, and it's a, a little indie movie called, uh, Avatar Two: the way of water. <laughs> okay. I, don't, I don't know if you've heard of it. Uh, it's vaguely familiar. Um, you know, good on you for championing, championing a lesser known film though. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> it's what I like to do. Uh, I mean, you know, we did that top 10 list last, last month and you know, I like to go I like digging for movies. Like I'm searching for truffles and <laughs> like Nicholas Cage's pig. Uh huh. Yeah. In the movie pig. Now, I said championing, but you actually haven't said anything about it yet. So I, I haven't. Have you seen it? I have not. Okay. Um, so if I may, I will, let me, let me chart my journey to see this movie, which was the movie comes out. I'm like, I don't give a shit about Avatar 2. <laughs> yeah, I, I like I mean, the that's... first one is fine. Like the, the thing that recommends the first one is that it was the cgi was amazing for the time and right. the 3d was really cool and i saw it a couple of times in the theater and then i saw it i think maybe once at home or a piece of it at home i was like oh yeah the like all the the bloom has fallen all, off this particular rose um it's not uh, like I, I didn't think it was a bad movie or anything um it's just like okay well this is you know, dances with wolves with big blue space cats and that's fine, but it's not anything I'm excited about. And so when they announced avatar two, I was like, Oh man, this thing's going to tank. Who gives a shit about avatar? Uh, and of course I was totally wrong about that, that part of it, of it tanking, you know, it's, I said the same thing, but I was wrong too. Holy shit. And so I didn't, when it came out, when it hit theaters, I didn't really care about going to see it. And then, um the girl uh decides hey can we go see avatar i want to see avatar and i was like oh have you seen the original and she was like yeah i was like okay well if you want to go see you know space cats we'll go see space cats and uh so 
we, you know, we, we did the 3D, not the IMAX or anything, but we did the 3D and stuff. And it was one of the showings with the, the high frame rate as well. And, um, and it looks incredible. Like, I don't know if I've ever seen a movie that looks as good as Avatar 2. Wow. Right. And then about halfway through the movie, I look over and there's a scene, slight spoilers for Avatar 2 if you haven't seen it, but it's called The Way of Water. So, you know, let's, let's be real with each other here that there was going to be water shit in it. But there is a point where Jake Sully and his blue cat family have to, <laughs> have to move to the coast uh, from, from middle Pandora and are sort of living amongst this group of the Navi that are more of a water culture. And they're kind of getting into that. And there's sort of the first big scene of them trying to fit into this culture where some of the, uh, you know, water space cats are showing the forest space cats. What's what in the water. And, they're you know they're diving down and you're seeing all the flora and fauna under the waves of pandora and it looks real because you know a million dollars was spent on every frame of this movie and i the high frame rate really worked for me and i thought it looked great and then i look over at the girl and she is just lost in wonderment oh you know like it just captivated her and I realized at that point, cause I was, I was sort of feeling the same thing. I was like, yeah, this is really cool. And I realized about not even halfway through the movie, probably an hour into the movie. I was like, I think I really like Avatar too. And, and I did, I really, really enjoyed it. You know, I, I probably land on like a four out of five stars for okay. the movie. Um, you know, like it's not breaking new ground. Like the biggest knock I have against the movie is that it's in incredibly predictable. And and so I, th I feel like it's, I, I'm going to have the same reaction to Avatar 2 that I had to Avatar 1, which is if somebody was like, hey, I want to go see Avatar 2 in the theaters, I would be like, absolutely, let's go. That is one of the most incredible looking pieces of cinema I've ever seen in my life. On the other hand, if somebody were like, hey, Avatar 2 is on Disney+, Plus, you want to watch it? I'd be like, eh, mm, not really. You know, like, I, I know yep. the story, and the story is fine. Um, you know, it's totally serviceable, but it's just such a technical achievement. And it's good. Like, I don't, I don't want to damn it with faint praise too much, because, like, it's engaging, and I was into the characters, and... You know, like James Cameron knows how to make a movie, right? Like, surprise, surprise, James Cameron, pretty good director. Um, but it's just like I, I was telling Chad this as well, like, and recommending that he take his son to it. Um, because I was like, I've just never seen a movie that looks quite like this or that says like sharp and and looks like I could see where somebody would be like, this movie looks too too soap opera y if that makes sense that kind of window pane quality yeah. where it's like it, it's almost too sharp and real yeah i actually am turned off by that usually yeah and and i kind of am too but it totally worked for me in avatar 2 where it's just like oh all of this looks real space cats look real the the whales that they're talking to look real and and i spent a fair amount of the movie asking myself like what is real in this scene you know, like, is any of this, is anything I'm watching right now an actual thing that was filmed? Or is this all computer generated? And I don't know the answer. Wow. Yeah, right, right. And so when you're kind of living in that that world of, what is it, verisimilitude, verisimilitude, the, whatever it is, the uh, uh, of, of authenticity in your filmmaking where I can't tell what is fake and what is not. Um, I mean, obviously the big blue space cats, I'm pretty sure that they didn't invent those in some genetics lab. I'm pretty sure all those were fake, but <laughs> probably, but there's a scene where Edie Falco, who's in the movie is in this like exoskeleton and is walking along besides one of the blue cats 
and and they're just kind of talking to one another. And I was like, man, was Edie Falco even outdoors for this? You know, because it looks fine. It looks real. But clearly she's not walking around in an exoskeleton, or I'm pretty sure she's not. And she's is she even walking in the sunshine? Is she walking out of doors? Is she... Like, did they animate her too? Did they just make an Edie <laughs> Falco on their computer? And, but it, it like it, it was stunning, I, you know. And yeah, it's just I've never seen a movie that that looks that real. And wow, yeah, I mean, I was totally skeptical going into it, coming out of the movie. the The biggest compliment I can pay is that. Um, you know, I know that they're going to do Avatar three, four, and five, and I'm like, great. I hope they'll look as good. I'll definitely go see Avatar three, and if it's as as cool looking as Avatar two, I will probably be happy. Um, so yeah, it was it was something like it, it's a it's a technical achievement, if not necessarily a narrative one, but the narrative is fine. You know, it's it's totally serviceable for the story they're telling. And there's some good action scenes. Again, James Cameron, director of aliens, no surprise when like the shit goes down and the blue cats start fighting. It's like, man, this is pretty cool. Zoe Saldana space cat running around with a bow and arrow, just fucking people up. It was fun. So yeah, it it was cool. I, I recommend, I recommend seeing it in the theater. I don't, I don't know how well it'll play. Like, I think it'll play fine on a small screen, but you're you're gonna miss what makes it kind of a spectacle. So yeah, well, I won't be there, but I, <laughs> but I'm glad that it was enjoyable. That's good. I have actually heard a lot of people prefer it over the first one. So yeah, yeah, I think that's fair. I think it's a better movie. I mean, like, I think it's a better narrative than the first one, and and again, technologically, it's head and shoulders above avatar all right then well good and i'm so glad she enjoyed it so much that's cool yeah and and for it being such a long movie also i was like oh man she's never gonna sit through this and and she did there there's one point where uh because there are some space whales again slight spoilers for avatar 2 uh humans show up and start like doing bad shit to space whales and uh when that happened when the you know you start seeing oh like the people have showed up and are starting to screw with the natural order of things here on pandora she was like i don't think i like this movie anymore i hate these people and i'm like don't <laughs> worry they're going to get it i assure you <laughs> i agree these are awful people but you just wait and sure enough they get fucked up and she was like oh i like this movie again i'm like right <laughs> <laughs> right. Welcome to narrative structure, kid. Ah, uh, that's so cute. <laughs> right where where you, villains are introduced and you really hate them, and then they get what's coming to them and you really like it. <laughs> and it's <laughs> cathartic, uh, is the word. Um, but yeah, it was fun. It was it was fun to see it with her. Um, and and she really dug it and really dug the three D and all that stuff. So like, she found the experience really magical. I think, and you know, I I, I can't say that. I wasn't influenced a little bit by seeing it through her eyes and seeing how like captivated and engaged she was with it. But yeah. also I'm like, eh, but who cares? You know, like what, what movies do that? Especially to kids who are just all hopped up on TikTok and shit for a movie that is, you know, three hours long to just make the kid forget about the phone. And and just be like involved in this world and everything. It was like, oh man, you know, well, well that done. right there is awesome. Yeah, that that, yeah, I dig that. Yeah, cool. All right, what else? Uh, what else you got? Okay, well, moving on over to Netflix, we have a brand new documentary. I guess it's more of an autobiography. Uh, I don't know. What do you call that? What do you call a video documentary? that's or like a biopic but that is like an auto by would it be an auto bio an auto biopic auto biopic i don't know but anyway this is pamela a love story 
And oh, yeah. it's um, Pamela Anderson, and she is well. She has a she had a book come out, but there's also she does address the whole sex tape thing, and I think that what spurred this was Pam and Tommy that came out on Hulu last year. Which, by the way, I fucking loved. It was great. It was just very entertaining. Mm -hmm. But it was very upsetting for her, and I can understand why. I mean, you have this thing that happened in her life that was so, it was so bad for her, and no one quite got at the time how it affected her so negatively and didn't seem to bother Tommy that much. I mean, he was mad about it, but he also, being a guy, it didn't hurt him at all. Like, he he just sort of took it in stride. He didn't really care, but it really was devastating for her. And then, you know, then you have the people who are like, Oh, well they just, you know, how convenient that it was stolen. And, you know, they, but, but this is before anyone was using sex tapes to become famous, you know, for, for celebrity. Plus they already were celebrities. So I never really doubted that about them like i didn't think they did it on purpose but i don't know watching this she you know she talks about when she was growing up and how she was noticed and then how she went to work for playboy and how she um then got Baywatch, and you, you know, you're just kind of going through her life but also her husband's which i didn't realize she had as many as she did but and it and honestly uh and you see her two sons who my god they look exactly like tommy Jesus Christ, he cannot deny those children. Like, it is insane. It's like he's, whenever her oldest son, especially whenever he comes walking on, I'm just, I think it's Tommy every time. And then I'm like, oh, wait, no, Tommy's like 60 now. But <laughs> um, it just was, it had a lot of very sweet moments, a lot of very uh, just, I don't know, vulnerable moments. And she's very open She's very just straightforward. She says what she thinks. She doesn't really try to hide anything. She's very honest about everything. There are a couple of times when she's like, I don't, I don't think I can talk about that right now just because she's too emotional, but she doesn't seem to come across as if she's purposely trying to hide anything or anything. She's just very forthcoming. And by the time we got to the end of it, I loved her. And I never disliked her. I, like, I didn't have an issue with her at, at all or anything. But I really felt like I felt for her on so many levels. And this is a woman who two things are clear to me. One is that she is a desperate romantic. Hmm. And she is has always been looking for that ultimate love that perfect movie style fairy tale love. And I feel like it's easy for her to fall in love, but then to maintain the relationship is where she finds the problem because I think she actually loves falling in love. And right, the other, right. the, the other thing that I think is very clear from this is that she will always, always love Tommy. Even though she'll she'll say, like, you know, it would never work between us. We could never be together. But it's clear that she is still in love with him. And I think she always will be. And her sons can't help. Because every time they walk in the room, it's just one giant reminder of him. And it's just a very tragic story. It's, it, But it's also, at the same time, it's uplifting to see her where she is now. And to see the relationship that she has with her children. And so there are good things. She has good things going on, but it's all, it's just so tragic because she has been on this constant search her whole life for something that I don't know if she'll ever get it. And every time she thinks she gets it, she doesn't. But then there's also, you know, that there's also that shadow of Tommy that I think will always be there. I don't know. It was just very good and very engaging and, you know, if I think for anyone who has ever just been curious about her or, or if you've been a fan or anything, I, this is was a very touching, sweet story and sad at times, beautiful at times. And she just seems to be she came off as an incredibly gentle, loving soul. Like, I just feel like 
her soul is pure. I mean, I could be wrong. I don't know her personally, but that's how she comes off. Sure. Yeah. You know, that that's interesting because I I don't know what I would expect her to be like, really. Mm-hmm. You know, because I kind of know her from when I think of her, I think of like Baywatch and barbed wire and right. not really the sex tape, although certainly, you know, that was part of the, the culture, but I just didn't think about it that much. No, and, I I'm like you though. I always think about Baywatch and barbed wire and stuff like that. VIP even, but, um, shit. Oh, they're also the, there are some wild inconsistencies in the Hulu series which is to be expected. It's a dramatic narrative. Like it's, it's a fictionalized account. So they made up a whole lot of stuff, (laughs) Mm -hmm. but when you watch it in here and it breaks down the, you know, where she was when things happened, because in, in the Hulu series, it makes it seem like she had her, had a miscarriage because of the sex tape, because of this distress that was caused by the sex tape. When in reality, she had miscarriage well before that was even a thing. So, they kind of just for narrative purposes, they moved things around and made stuff up, which is not surprising, but I think that I I would recommend that people watch this and not take that, take that series to heart because while a lot of it was accurate, a lot of it was not. Sure. Right. Right. Like take it with a grain of salt. Right. Yeah, I mean, and it's just, it's for entertainment. But then at the same time, I guess that opens up the argument. Is it okay for us to find entertainment in something that was so tragic for someone else? I mean, of course, ask, that's a whole, right. that's a hot, that's a hot button topic right now anyway, with, uh, with all of the hullabaloo about true crime. Sure. Right, right, right. Like, you know, Here's the thing, and and I don't mean to sound like I am callous at all, because I, I really am not. Like my my heart uh, goes out to anyone who suffers, but also, you know, when something happens on the public stage like that, you know, it, it's it's part of our our sort of cultural subconscious, and I don't know that anything is really off limits, like e- even. I know there was a, a bit of a brouhaha uh, over the crown recently because it's sort of catching oh, up yeah. to modern day. And I'm like, eh, but kind of who cares about that? I mean, I have less sympathy for people who are in the royal family anyway. But also, look, it's it's a fictionalized version of that. Like, we, we've been doing that, you know, for time immemorial. Oh, you know? for sure. I mean, and, and if you go all the way regarding the like the true crime argument I was telling I was talking to Brian about this the other day um I may have been a little high which may make me a little talky but I <laughs> but I got into this whole thing where I was talking about how um if you I mean you go all the way back to history during the terror people thousands of people would stand in the square to watch the aristocrats get their heads taken off. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, gr- the Grand Guignol, which was an entire theatrical experience built around watching as realistic as you po- as you could possibly get at the time, death. Uh, it's there's something that we have always been, uh, as, a, as a species, attracted to. It's just, it's always, we've always been interested in the dark side and, the, and I'm right there. I'm not... I'm not any better than anybody else. I always have been too. That's just who we are. So I do think that making a documentary about something is far less gruesome than watching someone be get beheaded in the middle, in the middle of town. Mm -hmm. Like, so I do think that we have come a little farther, but it's just, it's something that's always been there. It's not a new thing. Yeah. I mean, and as, (laughs) As both a a writer and lover of stories, I think, you know, we tell ourselves stories as a way to process some of that information and to to internalize it and to deal with it and and think about uh, the the empathetic portion of that, of what would I do in that situation? You know, I like I was just listening to the most recent uh, last podcast on the left, which was all about the Essex, the what was sort of uh Bobby Dick was loosely based on about a 
ship that got actually attacked by a giant sperm whale and the survivors of that, like the boat sank and a bunch of survivors ended up on these long boats trying to make their way to uh, safety. And during the course of that, there were like incidents of cannibalism and people dying. And, you know, I mean, as you would imagine, (laughs) it was a big mess, but like, that's a story that at this point is, you know, 400 ish years old. Right. And it's still fascinating because it's, it's a story of like survival and struggle. And like, it has all the ingredients of those things that we just as human beings like to think about, which is what is the worst situation I can think of and how would I get out of it? And, and did the people in this story that I'm thinking about, did they get out of it? And I think like a lot of true crime and, you know, uh, like our, our appetite for stories that are kind of terrible. Uh, I think that's just human nature, you know, like, I don't think we should feel too bad about now, you know, should we make a point to try to, you know, humanize the, the people in the story, especially if they are still living and still, you know, part of the conversation, then sure. You know, you, you try to do that as, as kindly as possible, but you know, for victims of, of crime, uh, or somebody like Pamela Anderson who lived through, uh, what was very much in the public eye and had these very public, you know, wins and losses and all that, that, at, you know, unfortunately that's just, that's part of it. Like it, it always has been, always will be. We are fascinated as a, a species with, you know, people who are, greater than ourselves and and sometimes are brought low like i mean shakespeare wrote about royalty right like he wasn't really writing about common people you know because it's more interesting to to put on a stage uh people who seemingly are you know i don't want to say are betters but you know like they're uh you know aristocrats and royalty and that kind of shit because that's the thing that allows us to to see uh, our own problems and feelings and struggles on a grander scale. And so, like Pamela Anderson, you know, I think probably the reason that her story is compelling, I mean, one, she was this, like, beautiful, sexy woman in the prime of her, of her life when she was you know, one of the most recognized people in the world. Um, but also like she had bad shit happen to her and we all as a, as as a people knew bad shit was happening to her and you could feel good about that. Like the sour grapes, like what, what makes her think she's so big? Um, you know, or the other side of that is just like, Oh, here is this incredibly popular person who I'm aware of for no other reason than, you know, she is this, you know, sexy woman who's an actress on, television but you know or was a playboy playmate or whatever whatever brought you to pamela anderson in the course of things um and sort of just how can you not be fascinated by somebody like that like one of the beautiful people so i don't know i i think it's just part of who we are i think i think we're just fascinated by the extremes right like the the oh, worst yeah. of human behavior the best of human behavior that kind of stuff um, yeah i mean And I don't think that that makes, I don't think that that means that our society today is worse off than we've ever been just because we've always had that fascination. And I think it's just, I think it's just inherent. I think it's just a part of humanity is that, you know, to be human is to be fascinated and curious by all sorts of things. Yeah. And particularly the extremes. Mm hmm. Yeah, I'm more surprised by people who aren't into weird shit, you know? Uh, yeah. Of course, that could just be the company I keep. But <laughs> but I do find it bizarre when when people aren't. <laughs> I'm yeah. like, really? <laughs> um, hey, I got a movie that we should talk about. Okay. Uh, I have a show in which we can. Oh, that's perfect. <laughs> 
Marink. So I feel like we need to talk about Skin of Marink. I feel like we need to talk about Kevin. Um, we need to talk about Kevin. <laughs> is a I'm fantastic kidding. movie oh it really is uh i have not yet seen skin of marink oh okay uh, I, we did actually have no but that's fine that, that's totally fine i don't um i'm just that was just saying that to say i don't have much to add about it but i do we did have a patron request it mm-hmm. i'm having to talk brian into it though because he's <laughs> he's a hard sell on that movie yeah and it, it's kind of a hard sell in general i think like it's it's the best way to watch that movie i think would be on a laptop with headphones oh okay you know it's like i had a less than ideal viewing of it because or or at a movie theater or something like that i know that it's on shutter now so that's how i saw it and I watched it in the bedroom and my girlfriend was kind of coming in, um, in and out a little bit and talking to me about different shit that was going on, which, you know, I'm not going to tell her to be quiet so I can watch this experimental horror film that is comprised of a lot of seemingly disconnected images and lingering shots and weird audio, uh, uh, a weird audio profile um because she would hit me and she would be right to (laughs) do you think it's scary um i do i think it's uh, is it it's more dread inducing which is is sort of what i want out of a scary movie these days like a jump scare jump scare is like you know a a trucker blow job yeah. It's just like, okay, well, that happened and that's fine, but it's not meaningful. Um, Skin of Marink is definitely a movie that I'll think about. And when I was watching it, because, you know, it, it's weird that this movie has caught the zeitgeist. And I don't know why. I think it's just sort of right time and right place sort of thing where horror movies are kind of in and artsy horror movies are kind of in and skin of rink is a super artsy like it's a it's a almost a german expressionist film with a lot of really long shots of weird corners of rooms and everything is slightly out of frame and the sound design is really unusual and at times borderline illegible or unintelligible and they're you know, the movie is wise enough to put um, subtitles in where needed. But okay. it's, yeah, I mean, again, it's a hard sell. Like, even as I'm describing it, I'm like, I if, hearing this, I would not want to watch this movie. Well, you're actually pretty much saying all the stuff I've already heard. So at least I know that it's consistent, um, you know, because I'm hearing... Pretty much the same comments from everyone. Uh, Dan Bone, who was it? Dan? I want to say it was Dan uh, from podcast on Haunted Hill. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want to say he's the one who was talking about how um, you never see the you never see any characters' faces or just they're just off screen mm-hmm. all the time, and he was. I think it was him. If it wasn't you, Dan, I know he listens to this. So if it wasn't you, Dan, I apologize. But, um, oh, you know what? Maybe I don't because he told Dan or he told Gav that I had Beast in my top 10. I'm like, no, I didn't. I gave it an honorable mention. (laughs) I'm teasing. But I think he was the one who was talking about the sound design as well. Um, So I've heard pretty much the same comments (laughs) from everyone who's talked about it yeah so you know the the big question is like how does all this add up you know like it, 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 it there are times where it's a little bit of a tough sit because it is just a lot of you know i'm staring at the same thing over and over and over again um you know i can barely make out what characters are saying to one another but then there are the and for those of you who are listening the rough outline of skin and Marink, and this is obviously giving away nothing because the experience of watching it is is very different than 
the the plot which is pretty loose but the idea is there's there are these two kids boy and a girl very young they um something is going on with the parents you know i don't know if it's uh and, and here's where you get into like what is the movie really about and maybe it's about child abuse maybe it's about divorce um but the parent there there's something going on with the parents p- potentially between the parents and they are gone they just sort of disappear and the kids are left alone for a long stretch of time and then they begin to hear voices that suggest that they're probably not alone in the house after all Uh, but the question is is who or what is in the house with them is it are they filming this or is it okay so it's supposed to be it's not film footage or anything like that it's supposed to be a like a third person point of view yeah but there are times when you do slip into like a first person pov and there, like, there's one scene where one of the kids is called upstairs by this, you know, his father question mark, um, and is is looking at his father who he you only ever see from about the waist down sitting on the bed, and in a very creepy scene. The father is like, "Look under the bed," and you're like, eh, "I don't think you should do that," and then you do, but it, like, there there's not this is not a movie of jump scares. It's more about this, like I said, this sort of kind of growing dread that leads to a conclusion that is debatable what it, what it means, but I found it really creepy. And there was one moment where, because Maya did not watch the movie. She was, she was in bed as I watched it in bed as well, but she was like, I, I'm not into this. And which is totally understandable. Like least surprising thing I've heard is somebody being like, skin of ink is not necessarily that captivating. Right. Especially if you're not like a horror nerd who's, who's sort of chasing that next high. And, um, but there was one moment where there's a quick flash, like there, there's sort of a setup and then you get a quick glimpse of what the payoff of that is. And I, and I actually said like, oh my God, <laughs> that was, that was kind of shocking. Um, but it's, it's super weird. It's, but the, the sound design I think is what kind of makes the movie. Um, and the, I mean, but the visuals are really good too. It's again, this is kind of a four out of five star movie, but that's for me and weirdos like me. If somebody was like, I would give this piece of shit zero stars because it totally wasted my time. I'd be like, yeah, I get it. You know, this is a movie that's not for everybody. It, I could see where it's real polarizing, but I thought it was really weird and unsettling. And, and it's made me think about like, what was the movie really about? And the last images of the movie, I think are really, really creepy. And yeah, it was, it's, it's worth a look, but you know, like if like Brian's reluctance is, is totally justified Mm -hmm. because it's you've got to kind of be in the spirit of it of like hey this is not going to make a lot of logical sense it it, you know like david lynch could have directed this although david lynch's stuff i think goes even harder on the weird whereas this is like okay the the overarching situation is really Mm -hmm. surreal and strange but it's also playing with fairly traditional kinds of scares, but couching those scares in this really experimental way. And so the scares kind of land a little bit better, I think, because it it's doing stuff where you're sort of expecting one outcome and getting another. But it's, you know, like I said, you know, of this this father that you don't quite see the entirety of and who should not be in the house based on what we know so far but is suddenly telling this child like you know in in a very weird sounding voice like a manipulated voice saying look under the bed and you're like no this is not cool well i definitely want to see it uh i particularly 
I try to see any movie that gets a lot of buzz. You know, I don't, I'm not one of those people that purposely avoids movies that everyone's talking about. I go to the ones that everyone's talking about because I want to, I like to have a frame of reference, like mm -hmm. cultural reference, you know? So if something kicks up a lot of fuss about one way or the other, I want to know what it's all about. I can tell you right now <laughs> that if I ever get to the point where I'm able to force him to watch it, it's probably going to be ugly. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> right. That is so not him. And it's not like he can't, you know, he doesn't like art films. He does, you know, or films that make you think he does. But it's one thing that really gets under his skin is just weirdness for the sake of weirdness. And so if it cannot justify the weirdness, then we'll have some issues. <laughs> but I am very curious. Yeah, I don't know that it ever justifies anything. Um <laughs> You know, it it's it sort of is what it is, and it's probably about ten minutes too long, which is not the worst crime a movie can make. But the, you know, it like I wish it had come in at a tighter like ninety ninety five minutes as opposed to hour forty five hour fifty whatever it is. Um, but it's it you know, it, it's interesting to me that this is the movie that caught that wave. Right. You know, cause... Well, it's it also is interesting to me that TikTok what like latched onto that movie months before it was released. Yeah. yeah, 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 and just ran with it. So, and we're talking about TikTok kids who now I'm not saying they're nothing derogatory here. It's just a fact that when you're watching that when you're on TikTok, and I've done it, you know, you just scroll, 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 scroll. Everything is just a you know mostly under a minute long, sometimes a couple minutes long, or, you know, if you can get longer stuff, but a lot of it is just watch and scroll, watch and scroll, watch and scroll. It doesn't require a lot of, of, I don't know, of concentration mm -hmm. or, you know, time commitment. You end up committing a lot of time, but not to one individual thing. So I just find it interesting that it has been so discussed and so divisive and so, I, I, I don't know, it's almost an enigma. And then yet it was latched onto so early on by these younger people who just took it and ran with it. I mean, and just, I mean, we're talking like, oh my God, it's the scariest thing I've ever seen in my life. And oh, I had to stop watching it because I was home alone and it was scary, you know? So I don't know that it would, I don't think it would necessarily affect me that way, but I'm curious to see what, you know, what did affect these people that way. Mm -hmm. So I'm, you know, that's why I want to watch it. I'm curious. So, yeah, like I said, I, I see both sides of this. Like it, the people who are like, this scared the living hell out of me. I can be like, yeah, I can see that. Uh, just as well as I can see somebody that was like, this was utter nonsense. <laughs> and I'm like, yep. I see that too. That is, that is not an unreasonable response to this movie. Cause it, it, it like it aims for the subconscious and, and you've really got to be into a movie that is not like if you, if I were to try to explain the narrative thread of that movie of like, and then they build a fort and then everything goes upside down for a minute. It's just like, what are you even talking about? Um, hmm. But anyway, uh, yeah, Che, I, I'll, I would love to hear your thoughts on it. So yeah, oh, I'm definitely going to watch it. I'll just have to figure out if it's going to be by myself. <laughs> You know, there is, like I said, I think one of the best ways you could watch this is if you were watching it in bed at night with Brian, only he doesn't have to watch or listen to it, where you just like get your laptop, put your headphones in, turn out the lights and, and let the movie happen to you that way. Mm -hmm. And I, I think there would be something to be said for that, for sure. Interesting. Okay. Uh, all right. What about you? That, that's enough on Skin and Marine. Okay, well, I have another new one. This is also from Netflix. This is Viking Wolf. Uh, it is a Norwegian werewolf film. Of course. And first of all, it it got points for me before I even watched it. One because it's Norwegian, and I have it. You know, I have a thing for Norwegian films. I don't know why, but I love them. And also, werewolves. Because mm -hmm. why not? Mm -hmm. As for the I, film my understanding is you are partial to werewolves. I am partial, yes. <laughs> so says my license plate. <laughs> Which, by the way, oh my god, you know what I found out the other day, and Oof. I didn't—I never realized this. Go on. That branch of the Nazis, 
that were I can't remember the German word for it. The, like Wolfpack but or whatever. Yeah. It's yeah, but it's like they spelled it W E R W O L F. And that's what's on my license plate because that's what would fit because you can only have seven characters. Oh no. And I was like, when I found that out, I was like, fuck. And Brian's like, what? I'm like, do you think that I'm driving around and people are thinking I'm a Nazi? He's like, baby, no, nobody thinks about them anymore. I mean, not Nazis, but this particular thing. He's right, like, right, right. No, nobody's thinking about that. And I'm like, I, <laughs> I'm like, oh my Lord. <laughs> Hopefully, though, they would see the other horror-related stuff on my car and then get it. But I'm just like, holy shit. <laughs> it's just, I don't know, it's kind of horrifying because I, I live in a big Jewish community and I don't want anyone to get the wrong idea. <laughs> right, to be like, hey, we might have a little bit of a problem here. We might, one of our neighbors. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I'm like, no, 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 I swear. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, that was just kind of when I found, when I... We were, I forget, we were watching some documentary and I was just like, oh shit. <laughs> but I'm sure he's right. I mean, it's nobody's, nobody's looking at that. And I don't know. It just, it just struck me weird. Uh, anyway, as for this movie, there's nothing really all that special about it. It's um, the, the werewolf is CGI. Mm-hmm. And it's a, by it's a, no, it's a quadrupedal werewolf. So. Uh, the the CGI is a little bit kinder, I think, when, you know, when it's an, an, like, looks like an animal versus if they, you know, it's not like a, it's not like a werewolf in Paris kind of situation, mm -hmm. but it still doesn't look great. But also, I'm also that kind of person that bad CGI just doesn't bother me unless it uh, is also tied to a bad story and everything else is bad. Like I can forgive a little dodgy CGI here. And I actually think there are a couple of, well, there are a couple of times when they do use practical effects during like, and they actually do a transformation scene, which you know what, go for it. Like I have not seen anyone even attempt a transformation scene in a while because no one wants to touch it because you can't, you know, you can't, you can't really do a good transformation scene when it's all CGI that I've seen, you know? So uh, even something big budget like uh, like the Wolfman with uh, Benicio del Toro, when they did when there was some practical stuff in there that looked great, but when they went CGI, eh, eh, like it mm -hmm. was kind of like eh. so it's kind of like that situation here. But and a lot of it, it it kind of is almost a Jaws ripoff in a lot of ways. Uh, there are actually a couple of times they pull lines directly from Jaws, which I think is hilarious. But I think that's another reason why I tend to be attracted to Norwegian films is they are clearly influenced by American film. And I love to watch them weave that in. Like it just, I, I have fun with that. But it's a woman who is a sheriff. She has just moved to this new town. That's always the case. Uh, she has uh, just moved to this new town to become the sheriff. And she has a teenage daughter who has a troubled past. She also has another little girl who is deaf, deaf. And the teenage daughter, so like, she has especially deaf. She's deaf, deaf. She's deaf, deaf. No, I was trying to remember if it was if she was deaf or blind, but she was deaf. And <laughs> the uh, uh, and there is, you know, there's a werewolf about, and then things happen. It's a little. It's got a little bit of a ginger snaps feel to it. It's got a little bit of a jaws feel to it. It's just. It just sort of pulls from a lot of different things. There's nothing amazing or new or groundbreaking about this story it is a very straightforward story but i think it was competently made even with the some of the dodgy cgi like i said i didn't mind it it was vicious as hell there's this great scene where there is a werewolf that just goes into town and just starts i mean just it it's insane. Like people are running all different directions. Werewolf is just like, rawr, just like, rawr, rawr, like, you know, just taking people down. They're dead people littering the streets. Uh, and I kind of feel like they did that on purpose. Like they, I think that was sort of a nod to Piccadilly circus in London. Mm -hmm. 
uh, in werewolf in London, I mean, but mm-hmm. it, uh, but without cars, like it was people just running around and, and just, it was just melee. And I had a really good time with it. I did. Uh, like I said, it's not, the story itself is very basic, but I think if it's done well, I, I don't have a problem with that. And I thought it was done really well. I enjoyed the characters. I, um, I, I just had a good time with it. So if anyone out there is a, uh, oh, it's also uh, in English. I want to say, yes, it's in English. It does have subtitles if you want them, but, but it's, uh, I want to say it was English dub, at least the version that was on Netflix, but it's, I, or not even dubbed. I actually think it was their actual, I think it was just their voices. Just but natively it, in English. Yeah. But if you like werewolf movies, I've seen a whole lot worse. Let me tell you, like, it's not up there. It's not in my top five or anything, but I have definitely seen a lot worse. So have I you, say check it out. Have you seen Amityville Werewolf yet? Have we talked about this? Uh, <laughs> oh my God. Yes, we actually did a Patreon review for that. Uh, we kind of brought, uh, did a one-off episode of Liking It just to bring it back so we could talk about that movie. Uh-huh. And uh, <laughs> that was hilarious because uh, Brian actually got a PR package for that one, which was really cool. Like they put a lot of effort into this PR box, which, and creativity which i thought was really cool so i was actually excited to watch it i will say that werewolf which by the way was designed by ken hall is probably one of the best looking werewolves i've seen in a long time for a low budget film the rest is the rest of the movie holy crap yeah (laughs) real garbage that was so bad Oh my God, it was bad. It was just bad. But I did like the look of the werewolf. <laughs> so. Okay, I, I'm just curious about it because I, when whenever I think of werewolf movies now, I'm like, how in the world do you fit a werewolf into the Amityville series? But then you I don't. realized, right, like <laughs> they're it's not really about the Amityville house anymore. No, it just takes place in Amityville, and it's not even filmed in it. Well, actually, I want to say. It might be. I can't remember if it was that movie or not that was actually filmed there, but I want to say it looks kind of like California. But either way, no, it's just they live in Amityville, the town of Amityville. Mm -hmm. And this has nothing to do, just like all the new Amityville. And it's the same guy. He's the same guy that just keeps cranking out all these. Is it really? I didn't realize it was like a dude who does all these uh, Amityville. It's like. Amityville Shark and Amityville, all the new ones, like okay. the ones that have nothing to do with anything. Uh, it's the one guy, yeah. and he just keeps doing it. And I guess it's kind of clever in a way in that it gets people to watch your movies, but it's also very disingenuous, and the movies are not good. Like, I've not seen a single good one, so <laughs> so it's just not worth your time. But Well, yeah, there was the yeah. dude who is doing that, you know, Winnie the Pooh, Winnie the Pooh, <laughs> Plu, yes. Winnie the Pooh, yeah. Blood and Honey. Um, and he's like, Hey, I'm going to do a whole cinematic universe. And the next one's going to be about like Peter Pan or something. And it's like, Oh, I mean, I, I get that that's your shtick, but also, uh, no, thanks. I don't need to see any of that. (laughs) A cinematic universe. (laughs) Right. Right. And he he was like, Oh, and the the next one I'm going to do like Tinkerbell is going to be a overweight drug addict. And I'm like, Oh, okay. Well, again, Thanks, but no thanks. Um, but, you know, all the best, I suppose. Where you just find it get... Well, it's like the dude who makes all those, like, Black House Ghost and all that stuff. Like, find a yeah. thing. Right, you got a gimmick, and, and then you go with it. Right, you just keep doing it until people stop caring. Mm-hmm. And, you know, or never start, in my case, where I'm like, yeah, whatever. Uh, although I do... I, I have to admit, I did see that Black House Ghost movie. The first one. Because it was free, and all the others were you know, a couple of bucks on Amazon. And I watched the first one. I was like, ah, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> no, <laughs> I, no, no, no further evidence needed. The defense rests, your honor. <laughs> All right. So that was my Norwegian werewolf movie. All right. Well, I'll tell you what, we're, we're almost wrapped up. I'm going to, let me throw one more at you. Um, 
just you know on the the hey why did anyone bother tip um so do you remember by any bizarre chance uh a horror anthology from a few years ago called Monsterland? I yes I remember it I don't remember if I saw it, but I know I'm actually picturing the poster in my head right now. Okay. So I'm aware of it, but I can't remember if I saw it. All right. Well, let me let me blow your mind a little more. Did you know that they made a sequel called Monsterland 2? I did not, but what a creative name for a sequel. Sure. Well, you know, um, <laughs> that's why they're artists, Jamie. <laughs> So I watched Monster Land 2, and it is uh, a whole bunch of nothing. <laughs> it is. It, I'll tell you. All right. Here's, here's the thing that actually actively made me mad. So um, <laughs> one of the. Uh, all right. So, let me see if I can find a list of the stories, and I will just go um, in order. But so it, it's the the framing device of it is almost better than anything else about it, um, which is just like, hey, here's a book of scary stories or whatever. And uh, let's see, Monsterland Two. Um, boy, this is a compelling podcast where I'm just like, I know that there is a list of what the stories are. Okay, here we go. So there was one called Brace Face that is about a young girl who gets braces and her father is like, no, 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 you got to leave these on even though you're being bullied. And then he loosens them up so she can take them off. And you're never going to believe it, Jamie. She's got crazy monster teeth and eats the people bullying her. Oh. Okay. Then there's. I have a feeling you could see that coming while you were watching. <laughs> oh, oh yeah! As soon as you see the the brace set up, you're like, "Oh, well, she's got monster teeth." Okay, I get it. <laughs> so there's one called Wormbug, which was probably the best of the lot, which was about a guy who ate a puppet bug that makes him like eat voraciously until he starts eating people. And that it, it's not very good, but it was like the puppet was kind of fun, if not very convincing. I mean, like it's really silly, but whatever. Um, then there's Justice Served, which was the last one. No, 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 it wasn't the last one. It was the second to last one. Anyway, that one was about a guy being on, uh, put on trial. And then you realize like, oh, it turns out that he's being put on a trial in a world where demons have returned and he was being decent or something to someone. And they were like, not in this court of hell. And you're like, oh, this is terrible. And then there was a simple procedure where uh, a woman is doing, uh, getting surgery. And it was very similar to that Twilight Zone, like, oh, but we're all monsters here kind of thing. Oh, mm -hmm. and but it was real quick, so maybe that was my favorite because it was only like ninety seconds long. Um, but then there was one called White Drift, which I almost can't tell you what it was about, other than there was this return soldier wandering into this town where like bad stuff was happening. I think they were werewolves. I think he oh. was a werewolf. I think that was the whole thing is that he was a werewolf and, and didn't want to get close to people. And then in, in, ended up eating this lady who worked at the diner. I could have that totally wrong. So don't hold me to that because it was the longest one. It was boring as shit. And it was, <laughs> it was hard to pay attention. And also, and I saw other people complain about this too. Um, the audio sync was off on that one. And oh, I, just just on the one story? Yeah. And huh. so I kept like refreshing the screen because I was watching on my computer and I kept refreshing it like, am I out of sync? Like I restarted it and did everything I could to try to fix this audio sync issue until I started reading other people being like, look, man, if you can't be bothered to sync up the audio with the lips of the actors, I can't be bothered to watch your movie. And I was like, you know what? You're right. But I'd already watched it by that point. So, you know, who's the sucker now? 
but it was like monster land 2 i gave it like a star and a half on letterbox and that was being generous because i i just didn't want to be an asshole i suppose but it's terrible it was a terrible terrible movie it like none of the stories were very good um the like i said the closest you come to is uh uh that worm bug one and that's just because somebody made a puppet that didn't look that great but it was something and yeah it's just rotten what a <laughs> rotten movie <laughs> like it, the technical problems with that movie were offensive of like you should not release this movie this broken well you know, it's the, I mean, you know, it's like it's the equivalent of releasing a video game that's got like a game breaking bug where you can't finish the game and being like, well, you know, best of so luck, it's everybody. Cyberpunk of right of horror anthology. Yeah, but they're <laughs> oh, but there's no post release patch for Monster Land 2 <laughs> where they make it all better and shinier. No, no, no. It's just just a bad movie that will continue to be a bad movie. And I'm here to warn everyone. Like if you are a horror anthology fan, like me, like I'm, then stay far, <laughs> far away from this one. It is, it is, it's none of the stories are very good and it's rotten with like technical problems and bad sound and bad color correction. And like the, the technical problems sink the movie before you even get to the fact that most of the stories are just boring and predictable. <laughs> so like it's the one, two punch of like, Hey, you think the stories are boring? Let me show you how poorly produced the whole thing is. Uh, and yeah, it was, it was real bad. Oh, um, I can't wait to watch that. <laughs> I, look, we are doing this. This is public service. Like just don't, don't do what I did and watch monster land too. just stay far far away it was on like plex or tubi or something like that uh and even at the price of free i felt robbed i felt like i i, I felt like i've been bamboozled by that movie so yeah it's terrible um hey well, let's uh before we wrap things up though uh anything in particular that you're looking forward to watching before we get out of here I am super excited about Cocaine Bear. Sorry, oh, Dave. Oh no, shit! <laughs> I cannot wait. I just that's the that is a movie that I've just been super excited about. Yeah. Uh, I don't know why. Because is it is, is it stupid? Yeah, <laughs> yes. But that scene where you see him just take the header like he's diving for the back of the truck, just midair, just and I'm like, I this. I mean it's over i gotta see this like i i have to i have seen no trailers i don't know anything uh, about what's coming what like what you just described to me i'm like oh please yes more of that <laughs> i just like all i know is the title and you know that's based on the true story and that elizabeth banks is directing and i'm like that's all i need to know it is a movie from a competent director called cocaine bear yeah plus and ray liotta before he died i didn't know he was movie. in it yeah I, yeah, I mean, all, yeah, right. All of that. All of it. All of it. There is nothing about that that says, I don't need to see this movie. I have to see this movie. Yeah. And like right away. <laughs> so that one I'm very excited about. I'm also very curious to see where they're going with Scream. Yeah, yeah. I saw that trailer. I thought that looked fun. And I, again, you, you know, we talked about it last episode, but mm -hmm. I, I really enjoyed Scream 5. I, I'm, I'm on board. I'm on board the subway full of ghost faces. Ghost facing. Yeah. Uh, anything sticking out for you? Uh, you know, I would like to see... I'm a bit of a sucker for the Marvel movies, and I'll probably go see that Ant-Man movie. And Jonathan Banks from um, Lovecraft Country is the heavy in that movie. So I'm kind of on board with that. And also, I'd like to go see Knock at the Cabin. I've heard good things about that. Oh, yeah, I have too. And I actually had planned to go see it last weekend. It didn't get to. And then I was like, well, I'll go see it this weekend. Didn't get to. So I don't know if I'm going to end up making it to the theater. But I was really interested in that one as where as well. As yeah. where. <laughs> as where. As um, where. And let's see. Uh... Oh, Evil Dead Rise. 
I want yeah, to see. that's around the corner. I, I can't wait for that one. I mean, like, we talked about Cocaine Bear. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, like, there's a lot of really exciting stuff coming. Um, Evil Dead Rise and, <coughs> pardon me, and and Cocaine Bear may be the, the two big ones for me, even though I do want to see. I, I, I was kind of waiting to hear what the the scuttlebutt was on knock at the cabin or Mm -hmm. knock in the woods uh, of the cabin knock on the cabin door (laughs) whatever that is and uh but but it seems like there's some some pretty good buzz around that and i just i I saw old and i was like i am way the fuck out on m night Shyamalan, and ding dong at the moment um but uh, you know we'll see that one was a conundrum for me i really liked the idea that there is a spot on the beach that when you get there then it just things start to age and i like a lot of what he did with that the thing that let me down about that film was the ending when like you find out what's going on and all that i'm just like Like, (laughs) yeah and i thought it like i never uh want to sound like i am down on performers like i cannot act acting is hard i don't care what anyone tells you that that's a tough job but i thought the performances in that from some very good actors i thought the performances were really bad i and i think i think it was probably like that was something that m night Shyam- Shyamalan wanted i think he wanted a certain vibe for that movie and it resonated at a frequency for me that i was not on board with where i was like i don't like the performances in this i like the premise but I, that's about all I like about this movie, and and I'm with you. I didn't care for the end either. So, um, yeah, I'm, I was I was way out on that one. I th- I thought it was terrible. Um, but I, you know, leave it to an artist to make a movie that is going to give you a visceral reaction, good or bad. So I don't. Th- there's plenty of M Night Shyamalan movies I really like that, and that's just not one of them. Is all. Yeah, that's true. Uh, Maxine is another one I'm really looking forward to. Oh, sure. Sure, sure, sure. Um, yeah, that's one we'll probably talk about once once that thing releases. So, um, All right, I think that's probably going to do it. We ran a little over our, our usual hour, but uh, who cares? It's a little, a little bonus for everybody. Well, if they don't like it, they can stop it themselves at the hour mark. <laughs> right, right. You know, I like the idea of the listeners being like, over one hour, no thank you. <laughs> and i am done <laughs> right right Fifty nine, fifty nine, 59 and 60 done i have allotted exactly one hour for the listening of this show if you have not completed your show by that time that is not on me that is on you yeah i am done <laughs> exactly right yeah yeah yeah. well but, then those people won't hear me tell them to fuck off no i'm kidding <laughs> i think we I'm should kidding. leave it I right there all. <laughs> all right bye everybody Bye!